In this video, we're going to talk about meconium. Meconium is a thick, green, brown, blackish substance that makes up the fetal stool. And meconium is going to appear around 10 to 16 weeks gestation in the fetal intestinal tract. Meconium is made up of a number of substances. These include things like gastrointestinal fluids, bile and bile acids, mucus, pancreatic fluids, blood, swallowed vernix, lanugo, and cellular debris. Meconium is not typically found in the amniotic fluid or on the fetus during birth, and instead it's usually passed within the first 24 to 72 hours after birth. Although meconium itself is not a pathological substance, when the fetus passes this meconium in utero, it, it puts the fetus at risk of aspiration, which can have serious consequences for the fetus. Signs that a fetus has passed meconium in utero can include staining of the amniotic fluid of meconium, as well as the presence of meconium around the fetus's face. Risks for passage of meconium in utero include post-term neonates. We see this in 35% of neonates who are past 42 weeks gestation. Risk also increases when the neonate is small for their gestational age, or there has been some sort of intrauterine growth restriction. Finally, Factors such as umbilical cord pathology or placental pathology can increase the chance of meconium aspiration as they put stress on the fetus in utero. Examples of this include any type of placental insult such as a placenta previa or placental abruption which may cause ischemia or damage to the placenta or any stress on the umbilical cord such as a prolapse cord or fetal trauma. As mentioned, smaller than normal gestational age also plays a part. In terms of pathophysiology, meconium aspiration starts with fetal gasping in utero or during the birthing process. As the fetus begins to take its first breaths, if, if there is meconium present in the amniotic fluid, this meconium can be aspirated into the fetal lungs, causing a number of problems. As we take a closer look at the pulmonary alveoli and the vasculature, we can start to define these issues more specifically. One of the first problems that exists with meconium aspiration is the mechanical obstruction of the alveoli. As meconium is aspirated in small particles, of meconium can make their way into the lower alveoli. They can have a ball valve effect where they actually lead to hyperinflation and blockage of air on expiration. As we can see here, as meconium enters the airway, it will be pushed down during inspiration. So as the neonate takes a breath in, that meconium can make its way down into the lower parts of the alveoli. However, when the neonate tries to exhale, that piece of meconium can be pushed out into the bronchial, leading to full obstruction of the alveoli and trapping of air. As this process continues and air continues to trap within the alveoli, it puts the alveoli at risk of hyperinflation as no air can exit on expiration. The second most common complication of meconium aspiration for neonates is pneumonitis. Pneumonitis occurs in 50% of all meconium aspirations and is defined as inflammation of the airways as a result of the irritants found in the meconium. As the meconium enters the airway, it leads to an inflammatory response and widespread recruitment of inflammatory mediators. As these inflammatory mediators make their way to the alveoli, they lead to an inflammatory response which can cause stiffening and fibrosis of the alveoli themselves. Another complication associated with meconium aspiration is surfactant wash. As meconium enters the neonatal airway and neonatal alveoli, the meconium can actually deactivate as well as wash out surfactant from the alveoli themselves. As we know, surfactant plays a role in decreasing surface tension with the alve within the alveoli, allowing that alveoli to stay open on inspiration. As we have the meconium entering the airway, it, the particles within the meconium can actually deactivate the surfactant or simply wash them out so that they cannot perform their function. As a result, surface tension will rise and alveoli are more prone to collapse, atelectasis, and we start to see a decrease in lung compliance. One of the more pathological features of meconium aspiration is pulmonary hypertension. As the neonate inhales meconium, meconium has, vaso meconium has vasoactive principles which lead to pulmonary hypertension or vasoconstriction of the pulmonary arteries. So as a result, we start to see this constriction and increase in pressure within the pulmonary arteries. Additionally, we start to see fibrosis of the pulmonary tissue, which is going to lead to widespread or long-lasting 
pulmonary hypertension. As a result, this can have serious consequences for right-sided heart function for the neonate. On top of the action of meconium on creating pulmonary hypertension, the VQ mismatch of less than one that's created in the neonatal patient with all of this meconium in their lungs also leads to hypoxic vasoconstriction, further augmenting pulmonary hypertension. The final consequence of meconium release in utero is not as much related to the aspiration as it is to the effects of meconium on the umbilical cord. Through the stimulation of inflammation as well as the vasoactive principles of meconium, we end up seeing damage to the umbilical cord itself. As meconium comes in contact with the umbilical cord, an inflammatory response is triggered which can lead to inflammation and fibrosis of the cord itself. Additionally, meconium induces widespread vasoconstriction, which reduces umbilical cord blood supply and can result in pervasive ischemia. As a result of this inflammation and vasospasm, the umbilical cord is at risk of ischemia, further leading to necrosis. These combined are going to further decrease the blood supply to the neonate, increasing risk of mortality. I've included a flowchart to summarize some of our findings of this video. First, there's a number of causes of meconium aspiration. Late gestational age can lead to maturation of the intestinal tract, which can cause passage meconium well in utero. Additionally, umbilical cord pathology or placental pathology can lead to hypoxia or acidosis of the fetus. This will increase the sympathetic nervous system response and result in stimulation of the fetal bowel. Fetal distress will also cause this by increasing sympathetic nervous system response, also stimulating the fetal bowel to pass meconium. If there's passage meconium and the fetus begins gasping or aspirates in utero, we can start to see things like mechanical obstruction, pneumonitis, surfactant wash, pulmonary hypertension, and umbilical cord damage as a result. Each has particularly negative effects on the neonate, which we can see here. In terms of mechanical obstruction, that will lead to air trapping, a buildup of CO2 and hypoxia, leading to a VQ mismatch of less than 1. Pneumonitis will also lead to a VQ mismatch of less than 1 by causing the infiltration of inflammatory mediators, leading to alveoli swelling and a fibrosis, and decreased compliance. Surfactant wash can also lead to this VQ mismatch of less than 1 by causing an increase in surface tension by washing out that surfactant or deactivating the, surf the surfactant, leading to atelectasis and hypoventilation and decreased compliance. The big problem with this hypoxia and this VQ mismatch of less than 1 is it leads to a rightward shift in the bicarbonate buffer system, which can lead to acidosis, CNS depression, decreased cardiac output, and ultimately death of the neonate. Pulmonary hypertension has equally negative consequences for the neonate as it can lead to increased pulmonary artery pressure, increased right ventricular workload, cause hypertrophy of the right ventricle, and ultimately lead to core pulmonal and right-sided heart failure. Umbilical cord damage is also pathological as it leads to inflammation of the umbilical cord, which can cause vasospasm and necrosis, which can further exacerbate fetal hypoxia.